Good, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're gonna give everybody a minute or two to come into the room. So please be patient. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to speaking with you today in about a minute. All right. Thanks everyone for joining this morning. Oh, wrong one. Thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, we're really delighted to have two of my favorite people in the whole world uh, talk to you about molecular testing and diagnostics and therapy. Um, we're going to initially have Dr. Neil Lindemann from Cornell talk to you for about an hour on uh, background technical theory, etc. And then uh, Dr. Matt Stackler from UCSF in California will talk to you for about 30 minutes on some case presentations, and then we're going to open it up to discussions. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and we'll turn it over to Dr. Lindemann. Before I do that, though, as a reminder, if you have a question, please put that in the Q&A box and we will answer all questions at the end of Dr. Stackler's session. If you have a technical problem, you can put that in the webinar chat. Uh, take it away, Dr. Linden. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dan. And I just want to thank everyone for the opportunity um, to speak today. I'm, I'm very excited to be giving this presentation thousands of miles away. Um, as Dan said, I am uh, at Cornell uh, in New York City, where I'm vice chair for laboratory medicine and molecular pathology. I just joined here actually after about uh, three months ago. For the previous 23 years, I was at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, um, where I uh, ran the molecular division there as well. And um, without further talk, I will move on uh, to the substance of what we're talking about. So the first thing I would point out at least in the United States, and I think around the world, is like oncology is in the middle of a storm. And like the four uh, winds of classical Greek mythology, there are forces both hot and cold blowing on our field and causing ultimately everything to spin around. It started with us in academics, um, making some initial discoveries and realizing the potential of the Human Genome Project and genetic information to change the way cancer is diagnosed and managed. And that was taken up by industry, which saw a real opportunity for um, industry growth and, and revenue and, and really fanned the flames and brought a lot of attention to the field. Uh, and a lot of new businesses started up and a lot of new tests were being developed. And then the, the cooler um, forces of government and insurance putting the the brakes on this and asking whether or not the technology and the, the medical applications are being diagnosed or being developed properly uh, and whether or not they're necessary. And so it's left patients and their doctors with a little bit of a quandary as to what to do. And an open question as to whether or not there is a clinical benefit to molecular diagnostics in cancer. And although most of us would say yes, not everyone would. Um, and certainly I have encountered um, folks here in leadership positions in the United States who, who aren't convinced that there is a benefit to molecular diagnostics in cancer. 
uh, and or if it is that it's fairly narrowly prescribed to specific circumstances. And uh, I'll be talking about some of that today. Um, and what it does lead to is what I see as a fundamental conflict between evidence-based medicine, which is uh, the notion that medical decisions should be based upon collections of large studies of patients where everything is controlled except for the one variable in question, and precision medicine, which is a notion that every patient is unique and they have their own com combination of genetic and environmental factors that should de determine a specifically tailored therapy. And there's actually no such thing as a thousand identical patients that can be put into an evidence-based study. And until we reconcile this tension between these two forces that dominate the way we make decisions as a society in, 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 in the world's medicine, we're gonna to continue to have these open questions about whether or not this should be done and whether or not other things should be done. So just for basic principles, and I, I know many of you understand this, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page in the beginning, I will point out that cancer is a genetic disease. And when I say it's a genetic disease, I, mean, I don't mean that it's an inherited disease, and that it's, it's not something associated with germline alterations. There are hereditary cancer syndromes, and, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that on another day, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. But rather, what I'm talking about are somatic genetic changes that cause cancer. These are genetic mutations that are acquired during life, <laughs> and that is what leads to the underlying basis of malignancies. And if you're familiar with germline genetics and constitutional genetics, the language that's used is dominant and recessive, and the analogous terms in cancer are oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Oncogenes are, if you will, dominant. One mutation activates an allele, and that drives cancer. And these usually involve things, genes that regulate, whose products regulate processes like growth, motility, and proliferation. And these are usually not always, but usually due to chromosomal rearrangements amplification of genes or some very specific what we call hotspot sequence mutations. Um, if you think about it, it's pretty unlikely that a random mutation is going to cause a gene to work more efficiently than it did before, but every now and then it happens. Those are oncogenes. The analogous uh, terminology for recessive alterations in cancer are tumor suppressor genes, and here both alleles have to be inactivated in order to drive cancer. Um, and these typically involve the, if you will, breaks on, on the cells. Uh, so deregulation of the cell cycle, inhibition of apoptosis, DNA repair. And when those mechanisms are lost, uh, then the cancers can grow. And these are typically due to deletion events um, or multiple different sequence mutations scattered throughout a gene. So for a tumor suppressor gene like P53, there'll be mutations all over the place. For a classical oncogene like KRAS, there's just a handful of very specific mutations. One of the fundamental principles of oncology is that oncogenes are easier to treat than tumor, tumor suppressors. So the oncologists are generally more interested in oncogenic drivers of cancers, they call them, which they can block with a drug, than loss of tumor suppressors, which then have to be replaced in a very specific context and that's a much more challenging thing to do from a therapeutic perspective. So most of the activity in molecular diagnostics for cancer that's around treatment selection is built upon uh, identifying oncogenes that can be treated. The other thing that um, is important for anyone studying, working in this field to understand, which is obvious to pathologists who have ever used a microscope, but is actually not obvious to many people who have not used a microscope, including many of our surgery and oncology colleagues, is that cancer genomes are what we would call mosaic in the genetics field. Tumors are not pure cancer. There's intermingled benign host cells, there's inflammatory cells trying to contain the cancer, and all of those have DNA. And so when you're looking at mutations in a tumor, unless you physically dissect out the cancer cells, which is generally not practical, what you're going to end up with in your test tube of DNA is a mixture um, of DNA, some of which has the mutations you're interested in detecting and some of which is completely normal. And then within cancers themselves, there's heterogeneity. So not every, well, the, all the cancer cells are believed to derived from a single precursor cell. Those cells are permissive of mutations. And so therefore there's variety within the cancer cells, the so-called 
early mutation, mutations that are present in all the cells are called driver mutations, and these are believed to cause the cancer. And then there are later mutations that evolve as cancers grow, which are called passenger mutations, and these modify the cancer's behavior. But treating a passenger mutation is not likely to treat every cancer cell in a patient. So again, the oncologists are more interested in these so-called driver oncogenic mutations. So what does this have to do with genetics? A role for molecular diagnostics in cancer really spans any kind of diagnostic role for any medical application from early to early detection, monitoring of therapy, identifying cancer, confirming that there is a cancer, establishing prognosis and selecting therapy. So to give a, a, an example of establishing a diagnosis, these five images are the so-called small round blue cell tumors, which are familiar to most surgical pathologists. While there certainly are some features of them that are distinctive from one to another, at a certain low level, um, low resolution level, they have a lot of similarity in their appearance. And it can be very difficult to identify which of the small round blue cell tumors you're dealing with through the microscope alone. But they each have different genetic alterations. <clears throat> and so I've listed them here, I won't read them for you. But each of these cancers has a different um, genetic alteration and identifying which genetic alteration is operating can actually be essential to establishing which cancer these patient, which cancer a patient has with a small round blue cell tumor and therefore selecting the appropriate therapy and the therapies are different. And so these lead to a family of what we call pathognomonic genetic alterations, where there are some cancers that are outright defined by specific genetics. When I got into this field in 1999, molecular diagnostics was, uh, a so-called ancillary technique. I still think it's, it's thought that way. It's a, it was a side activity um, that was helpful, but not really necessary. But now things have changed. And if you look at the World Health Organization, WHO, diagnostic criteria for certain diagnostic entities, a genetic um, analysis is absolutely required in order to define what uh, the diagnostic tumor, what the tumor is from a diagnostic perspective. Often the pathognomonic genetic alterations, not always, but often they're chromosomal rearrangements and very commonly in sarcomas and hematologic malignancies. I've listed a few. This is not by any means an exhaustive list. But these are some of the most well-characterized and most well-established um, genetic alterations that define certain cancers. And you know, I would submit that if you don't have a BCR able one fusion, you really can't make a diagnosis of CML anymore. Um, that was not the case in 1999 when there was a so-called Philadelphia negative CML, which was a disease entity, which no longer really exists. So how do you detect rearrangements and how do we do this in the laboratory? There's no perfect method. Um, and, and this is why there are multiple different uh, methods to choose from. And each one is different in different circumstances. And most laboratories will have many, if not all of these available if they're trying to provide a full spectrum of services for patients with cancers that require rearrangements. So the first method is a chromosome analysis or karyotype, growing the cells in culture, arresting them in metaphase, analyzing those metaphases and determining whether or not there's a large gross translocation that can be seen by naked eye. This is a, a difficult thing to do. Not every tumor cell grows terribly well and the interpretation is highly specialized. So there are certainly laboratories that have a developed um, center of excellence around cytogenetic analysis of cancers, um, but, but not every laboratory can do that. The other techniques are a little more portable um, and, or maybe uh, generalizable. It uh, can be done in, in multiple labs. So uh, FISH, fluorescence and situ hybridization can work for detecting translocations or large inversions. So inversion would be two changes on the same chromosome. And as long as they're not too close together, uh, and then um, in the native configuration and when split, you can detect them with fish, but there are certain um, rearrangements such as RET rearrangements in lung cancer where the distance between the genes that are typically involved is too close and fish is, is not a viable test for that. 
Immunohistochemistry is, is a relatively simple, easy technique, but remember that immunohistochemistry is looking at the protein, which is the consequence of the genetic change and not the genetic change itself. And so in order for immunohistochemistry to work, the genetic change has to change the protein expression, either increasing it dramatically, decreasing it, which is relatively rare for oncogene alterations, or maybe changing the context and moving, for instance, a nuclear protein into the cytoplasm or vice versa. So immunohistochemistry can be viable for some um, rearrangements, but not all. RT-PCR, that's, that's taking RNA and then converting it into cDNA and amplifying it with specific primers around specific breakpoints. And this is a viable technique for translocations where there aren't a lot of, where there's not a lot of variety in breakpoints. Um, and so it's common in the hematologic malignancies, for example, BCR able, there's really two to three breakpoints, really three breakpoints, um, and RT-PCR can be performed for that without too much difficulty. Similarly, uh, sarcomas often have a few breakpoints. However, often those samples are in bone and the DNA is not the best for RNA analysis. Going beyond RT-PCR, if there are many breakpoints that are required, our, our RNA next generation sequencing can be performed. And I think this is probably the most broadly applicable um, technique, but it can be a challenge uh, to get all the sequencing out of RNA, as I mentioned before, especially from bone, but RNA is a labile analyte, unstable. Um, it can be difficult to work with, particularly if the sample uh, collection and the laboratory are not close to one another. Also, sort of by definition, detecting things by RNA uh, sequencing or RT-PCR requires that that fusion rearrangement RNA is actually expressed. So it doesn't work for loss of function translocations um, and some of the immunoglobulin and T-cell receptor gene rearrangements that don't actually create a, a fusion transcript. And then there's DNA, uh, next generation sequencing. <coughs> um, and this can work if the breakpoints are in introns that can be basically completely covered. But sometimes the breakpoints are in very, very broad regions and there's just too much, as we call it, landscape or real estate, too much DNA to try to sequence across to make it practical. As the DNA sequence instruments grow in capacity, this will become more and more viable. So aside from the sort of diagnostic alterations, there's also prognostic alterations. And there's two categories of prognostic um, alterations that we think of in broad strokes. There are those that have very high impact, and those are the kinds of prognostic changes that actually determine therapy. There's a, quite a few of these in um, hematopathology, where the presence of, for instance, a FLT3 internal tandem duplication has, or an Icarus deletion, a FLT3 ITD in AML, or an Icarus deletion in ALL, have such an advanced prognostic implication that those patients are going to be treated more aggressively uh, than tumors or leukemias that don't have those alterations. And those are the kinds of prognostic alterations that at least in the United States, insurance companies are willing to pay for and can be made available to patients. There are a lot more that have a general prognostic impact, smaller studies, and it's not entirely clear how that information will be used. A good example would be a P53 mutation in lung cancer. There's a number of small studies that show that a, the presence of a P53 mutation confers a, a worse outcome, but there's not a different treatment based on it. And a lot of these um, are in the tumor suppressor family, as I mentioned before. Uh, it's very hard to replace TP53 if it's lost in the right clinical context. And, and so there's information about prognosis, but it's not clear that it's used. Um, and generally speaking, these are not reimbursable activities in the United States. What about selecting therapy? So here is an example of a point mutation. And it's a very subtle thing. This little blue line here shows a change between a T to a G um, at this nucleotide, which changes EGFR exon 21, codon 858 from a leucine to an arginine. And that little change is all you need to drive therapy for a patient. And a patient with wild type EGFR, assuming there are no other alterations, may get a platinum doublet chemotherapy, 
cytotoxic chemotherapy with a lot of side effects, and the one-year survival is about 5%. And the presence of this mutation will drive this patient to a targeted therapy with an osimertinib, it's an EGFR inhibitor, now third generation inhibitor, and the one-year survival is about 70%. It's dramatic difference in the treatment. This is also a more well-tolerated drug than platinum doublet chemotherapy. Um, and the likelihood of survival is dramatically different based on just this one little nucleotide substitution. <clears throat> um, I thought I had more on that, but okay. Uh, other things have to do with minimal disease testing, whether or not we can detect cancers early. Uh, and so there has been a lot of enthusiasm back in the 90s about this, um, looking at blood and stool assays from mutant KRAS, and the technology just wasn't really there. And there were a lot of false positives and false negatives. Um, but now with the so-called liquid biopsy uh, and the uh, emergence of more sensitive and specific assays, the principle and the promise of early detection of cancer is in front of us. Uh, and there's a potential, certainly for some cancers, to diagnose and manage patients before they even get a tumor that requires a surgeon to cut something out. There are some challenges though, right? So most of the mutations, particularly in carcinomas, are not specific. And so finding, for instance, a KRAS mutation in someone's blood doesn't necessarily mean that they have a pancreatic cancer or a colon cancer or a lung cancer. It could be any of those. And that then will have to launch a search uh, for where uh, the mutation is coming from. And then the other thing to keep in mind is mutant DNA can be present in the absence of cancer. There can be a cell that develops KRAS mutation and then is killed by the immune system. Um, and it's, it's not a viable tumor, but that DNA is still circulating for a little while. Um, and, and so that's also a possible challenge. And so there's a, perhaps more enthusiasm at this point for monitoring cancers with known mutations after therapy uh, than there is for early detection, but I think we will um, find ourselves doing early detection uh, in, in short order. So here's an example of a cell-free circulating DNA assay, the so-called liquid biopsy. It's, it's not a name I love, but I'm not going to change the name. Everybody seems to like it. Uh, and <clears throat> this is just a single gene assay now for EGFR. The interpretation is like a flow cytometry. Um, and there's PCR that's done for two different positions. The mutant is along one axis, the wild type is along the other. Um, and depending upon, and this is done with fluorescent dyes that are specific to the different alterations. Um, there are some droplets that have both, um, which would be a mutant and a wild type, and then some have only mutant, some only have the wild type. So this would be an example of what an L858 monitor mutation could look like, and it's essentially a modified flow cytometer of each of these individual droplets where the PCR reactions take place um, that makes a diagnosis. And generally speaking, this agrees pretty well with biopsy, particularly on the specificity. There's very few false positives um, with this lower resolution technique. Um, if you call one or two droplets, then you're going to run into false positives. But when there's a significant signal, no. Um, but there are certainly some false negatives, um, which calls into question its ability to serve as a screening test, because if it's negative, it doesn't exclude the possibility of a cancer. Here's a meta-analysis. It's about eight years old now. There are some new ones, but uh, showing basically how liquid biopsies perform for EGFR and lung cancer. And as you can see, the sensitivity is really all over the place. Some studies show it very low, some show it quite high. The average is somewhere around 70%. But the specificity with the exception of maybe one or two outliers is generally speaking over 90% most of the time. But a, a, a more promising application I think has to do well with the ability to monitor. And so here are some studies, it's probably a little hard to see, but correlating the amount of mutant DNA along with radiology images and showing that the presence of a mutation that's known in a patient as the original tumor is tested. And then we know when we follow, we're gonna look for this mutation and see if and when it comes back over time during therapy actually anticipates the radiologic findings. Uh, and so 
the oncologists are very excited about using this test as a blood test to monitor when patients may be progressing on therapy and developing resistance. Um, that gives them a little bit of a head start compared to following them with serial imaging. Uh, and this is still unproven, um, but it's, it's a technology and an application that is very much emerging. For the initial diagnosis, as we mentioned before, if we can't get tissue, it's, it's better than not testing at all uh, if there's a, a, a mass that's known. Um, and then certainly when patients have resistance, if they can't undergo another biopsy uh, to test the cell-free DNA is a viable alternative. So all of this has really led to a change in oncology, which, which um, essentially has replaced the cytotoxic chemotherapy, where non-specific treatment targeting all replicating cells. And, diagno and treatment was based exclusively on microscopic diagnosis and, and radiologic diagnosis. So stage grade in histology was all you needed to determine treatment. And for lung cancer, it was really either it's small cell or it's non-small cell, and that was it. And that has completely changed in the last two decades where now there's therapies that are less toxic, more effective, that are aiming at targeting the specific problematic molecule that's driving each of the cancers. And that's transformed what we do in pathology. And it's, it's honestly no longer enough to just give stage grade in histology um, for many cancers, particularly in lung cancer. And the molecular classification is actually really more important in determining what's the right treatment option. So does it work? Yes, it works. Um, so here is an example showing how EGFR inhibition, which is the green line, gives better survival to chemotherapy, which is the orange line in patients that have mutations. And importantly, it's worse in patients who don't have the mutations. And this, is, this was the first such study. It was corroborated by four more randomized phase three trials conducted around the world. This one was in Asia. Uh, and that has changed the way lung cancer is treated. Not just lung cancer. Here's a similar study looking at BRAF targeting in melanoma. And again, uh, this is just one arm showing patients that have the mutations, but the folks who have mutations who get the targeted inhibitor, BRAF mutation, BRAF therapy in blue do much better than the patients who get chemotherapy in black. And you can go over and over again in different cancers. This is a kit mutation in sarcoma where there's different mutations. KRAS, it's inverse. So patients with KRAS mutations do worse than patients who have wild type. IDH in glioblastoma has an alteration in prognosis here. There isn't an effective or wasn't an effective treatment. And then this is a different way of showing the data. These are ALK inhibitors, lung cancer showing tumors shrinking, which is a different outcome than survival, but still showing a tremendous benefit um, for the ALK inhibitor in patients that have the ALK rearrangement. And then this is a, the first such, this was a study of a panel of 14 markers that came out of the Lung Cancer Mutation Consortium, which was a multi-center effort. Again, eight years ago, this is not new, um, but showing that for lung cancers that have a targeted therapy, they live about a year longer than patients who don't or who don't have a mutation. And those targeted therapies are more effective and less toxic. And it's working. Um, so lung cancer, for example, it's getting better, right? So if this is 2015 to 2019, looking at trends in death rates, and if you look at the cancers down here where the death rates are getting the best, are, are doing well, it's lung where there's targeted therapies. It's melanoma where there's targeted therapies. It's Hodgkin lymphoma where there's immune therapies. Well, I'm not gonna talk about those today, but these are diseases um, that have really sort of led the charge in precision oncology. Um, and this is in males and also in females. Uh, again, sort of this change is having an impact. So then that leads us to know sort of what genes should we test? Lung cancer, I've talked a lot about EGFR, a little bit about ALK, but it's, it's complicated, right? There's 10 different markers that you can look at in lung cancer. And at a certain point, they get pretty small in, in frequency, 1% or less of lung cancers. Uh, and how much evidence do you need? So for EGFR, there are phase three randomized control trials, multiple ones. 
ALK was approved by the United States FDA with only a phase two trial. It's, it's really pretty impressive when you think about it. And then RET and NTRAC, those, you know, became standard of care from case studies and animal studies and then sort of very small studies. And then MEC, all there was was cell lines. And so I call this evidence regression. But when we're developing a clinical test that's used for oncology, we have to decide where we draw the line as to what we're gonna test. Are we only gonna do things that are approved by government agencies or are we gonna include things that have smaller levels of evidence? And the list goes on and on and here's eight more genes and many of these have become standard of care in just the past two years. The field is moving very rapidly. And if you can only develop a new assay every two years or so, it's really hard to keep up. But there's also squamous carcinoma and there's alterations in squamous carcinoma. And I've only talked about lung cancer, right? And I've only talked about DNA. And so when thinking about developing an assay, it's important to understand what it is that you're doing. Um, and so from a lab perspective, you need to know what your oncologists want, what your surgeons want, what your fellow pathologists want in order to make a diagnosis. And depending upon where you practice, there may be things to develop that your researchers want. And it's common sense, but I've seen mistakes made where laboratories develop tests because of what they think is important without getting confirmation from the people who are going to use the tests. And then they've developed tests that don't actually perform the way they really need to in order to drive patient care the right way. In order to understand which targets to choose, there's no great mystery here. You have to know what you're capable of doing. How much of the genome are you gonna cover? How much copy number information do you need? Structural rearrangements. How much ability do you have to interpret the results? Uh, this all requires professional physician staff or PhDs with specialized training to look at the data and interpret it. And the government here would very much like this to be a black box solution where the assays come with interpretive software that essentially generates a report. And some of them do, but they are not quite accurate. And they require, uh, like I said, an expert to review that information and confirm what's right and to find the things that are wrong and correct them. And we haven't gotten to a point where it's push button, walk away, and out comes a report. And that all takes time and expertise. Uh, how can you figure out what you need to use? Well, there are guidelines um, and they're useful to look at. So the NCCN in the United States, WHO, uh, ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, make guidelines for each of the cancers that talk about which are the genetic changes that are important for managing patients in NCCN or for diagnosing in WHO. There's a particular guideline effort in lung cancer that I'm involved with that involves other organizations, but it's the same basic idea. And then the CAP has molecular templates for many different cancer types uh, to make it easier for pathologists to understand what are the genetic changes that should be included in every workup of a cancer. Un uh, fundamentally though, for any clinical test, whether it's molecular diagnostics or you know, good old fashioned clinical chemistry, you need to understand how the test results can change management. And then once you figure that out, you can decide whether or not you want to include any so-called interesting targets. And these are things for, clinical trials and investigational therapies and maybe prognosis or hereditary risk assessment. Maybe you're gonna target a pathway. Um, and so the gene itself is not as important because you can block in the pathway support. Um, and small studies that haven't quite made it into practice guidelines, but are compelling. And these are decisions that you'll have to make with your colleagues in your own institution. There's no simple answer for those. And this is where we get back to what I was talking about before where in precision medicine, every patient is in their own boat and they have their own unique combination of findings and the treatments, while there aren't an infinite number of treatments, should be customized and tailorized and tailored to each individual patient based on those factors. As opposed to evidence-based medicine where you have a thousand people that are all in the same boat and you look at how they do or do not respond to a specific treatment in a specific context based on the biomarker. And as those percentages get smaller and smaller, so I showed you the lung cancer where there's mutations that are 1% or fewer, it becomes impossible to do this kind of study. 
you can't really easily do an evidence-based medicine trial of NTRAC fusions in lung cancer because it's less than 1% of lung cancer patients it will take you you know a decade to accrue enough to do that study so you have to flip over to this model but then our regulatory infrastructure isn't quite caught up to this and doesn't support it and that creates this tension so what are the common targeted genes that are important for diagnosis for management in particular and for monitoring i've listed some of them this is not a comprehensive list but it's fairly thorough and it keeps changing. Um, and so, you know, I had to change this just from, you know, a, a version of this that I gave a few months ago because it's changing all the time. Um, and new discoveries are commonly, constantly being made and shown to be important. Um, and so that was sort of arranged by gene. And you can see many of these alterations, you know, EGFR in lung is, is a kind of unique thing where it's a cancer and a mutation that you don't see elsewhere. But other things you see in multiple cancer types, BRAF in particular is in many different kinds of cancers. And then looking in, in a given cancer type, you have different alterations. So in lung cancer, there's you know, about 10 different alterations that have different treatments. Melanoma is a handful, um, GI stromal tumor and so on and so forth. So when you're deciding what you wanna do, you have to think about how to organize your approach. If you're gonna do it in a disease specific way, you have one way of doing things. If you're gonna do it in a mutation or a gene specific way, you're gonna do it a different way. Or perhaps um, instead of doing one gene at a time or one cancer at a time, you just look at this holistically and give everyone the same test that's broad enough that you can detect everything. Um, and that's the approach that we took, right, is rather than doing multiple single gene assays for lung cancer or doing, you know, a BRAF test, or doing individual genes for many different cancer types, we looked at using next generation sequencing, which is a technology that enables large scale testing. We can look at literally hundreds of genes in any cancer tape type and we can look at sequence changes as well as copy number and structural rearrangements all at once and it's it's really been a breakthrough that has enabled molecular oncology to um, succeed so this is a test that we ran at my previous institution brigham women's hospital dana farber it's called the onco panel 450 genes we did it on every cancer type we tested 60,000 samples this is not unique it's done in many other centers there's a test here where i'm at Cornell called the TSO 500, 500 genes, and there's many commercial labs and startups operating in this space as well. These were the two tests that we had at Harvard, the Oncopanel test, which was for all cancers, and then there was a more rapid test that we did for acute leukemias. Um, we actually did more of those, and this was turned around in a couple of days, whereas this was in a couple of weeks, again, based on the clinical urgency. Here are the genes that we had on our Oncopanel test. Profile Oncopanel version three is what that acronym stands for. Um, and you can see it's, it's a fairly comprehensive panel. Just an aside, I got into this field in 1999. And if I had proposed to interpret three to 400 genes in a cancer sample, I'm pretty sure I could have gotten a PhD for that. And as of about seven years ago, I can do it in five minutes. So the ability to interpret, generate and interpret data has, has really grown on an exponential scale. In 99, we were doing Southern blots, which would take two weeks to give you information about one gene. And now we can generate literally billions of copies of DNA with one assay run in, in a few hours. It's no other field, as far as I know, in diagnostic medicine or medicine in general has grown at, su at, at such a tremendous rate in what's a relatively short time, 15 years. What have we found? This is a little bit of a old data poll, but the short of the, 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 the tendencies hold, which is that about 60% of tumors group into what we call tier one and two, which are known essential for patient, uh, patient care or um, essential for experimental trials of patients, which was very important at the cancer center where I was. That's about two thirds of all um, patients. And then another quarter or so had something that was interesting in terms of data in preclinical models, uh, 
cell lines or animal studies suggesting that there might actually be an intervention that could be tried in someone who didn't respond to conventional therapy. So if you add those up, that's about 80%. Remember, we were testing everyone. Of every cancer patient who walked in the door had something that's at least potentially useful. And the only ones who didn't were this green category and this very slim purple, which was less than 20%. That's remarkable when you think about it, of unselected cancer patients at a tertiary care cancer center. The test doesn't always work. Um, and this is important for uh, pathologists in particular to understand. Tumor heterogeneity is a problem. If there are too many admixed normal cells, as I mentioned before, that mosaicism of tumors, not going to work. Sometimes there's not enough. And this is a real challenge with very small biopsies, which is an emerging trend here, doing things through um, endoscopes uh, and single needle cores. There are some treatments that we do in pathology that are damaging the DNA, in particular acids, um, and there are acid fixatives, and there are acid decalcification technique, and acid destroys DNA. And then there are other substances that just interfere with PCR, and these include metals, so metallic fixatives, metal binding protein, hemolyzed blood, uh, hemoglobin, and then heparin will all inhibit these assays. We don't necessarily, we can work out of standard formalin fixed DNA, a special sample isn't needed, um, but we need to uh, make sure that we avoid some of these other uh, treatments that sometimes can be performed in pathology labs. The other thing that you can learn from next generation sequencing is beyond a collection of individual genes, there's also uh, an emerging field of pan mutational analysis, looking at patterns of injury across multiple genes on the panel, and then learning something about the etiology or the mechanism of the cancer. And so these include things like detecting mismatch repair deficiency by looking at the way different genes, whether they're in oncogenes, tumor suppressors, or just background genetic content, to look at the kinds of mutations that are present and to infer that there could be an underlying mismatch repair deficiency and therefore could be treated with a um, immune checkpoint inhibitor. Similarly, a lot of emphasis is looking at, is underway now trying to detect homologous recombination deficiency, which is a different mechanism of DNA damage scattered across the genome and then treating those patients with a partner inhibitor. Uh, and then there are other things that are still uh, looking for application like poly mutation in um, endometrial cancers, those have a much better prognosis, so they can be treated more conservatively. So again, this is a prognostic indication that leads directly to a change in the management style. And then other things such as uh, exposure to virus, UV light, alkylating chemotherapy can help um, resolve some differential diagnoses at times. So a word about mismatch repair deficiency. The slides were prepared by a former colleague of mine at Harvard, Jonathan Nowak. And there's a number of different ways to look at mismatch repair deficiency. All of these um, are suitable um, for treatment um, with a uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor in a variety of cancers. And there's microsatellite instability testing where DNA is amplified across segments of repeat elements, which are very susceptible to mismatch repair deficiency, looking for a shift in the pattern. And so here would be an example of a normal sample where the um, there's no change between the tumor and the normal. And here's an unstable pattern where here's again the normal and there's many, many more fragments seen um, in the tumor sample. But we can do immunohistochemistry chemistry for the proteins involved in mediating mismatch repair. And we're looking for loss. So here there's a nice internal normal control, these crypts. And then we can see MSH2 and MSH6 are expressed, but MLH1 and PMS2 are not. And so this would be an indication of a loss of um, mismatch repair due to one of mutation in one or of these two genes. So here's a case. We look at multiple markers, normal tumor, normal tumor, normal tumor, normal tumor, and they're exactly the same. That's an MSI stable tumor that should not be treated with a immune checkpoint inhibitor, all things being equal. And then here's one where there's difference. We look at multiple markers to increase our sensitivity. Normal tumor is different, normal tumor is different, normal tumor is different, normal tumor is subtly different, but still different. And this would be an example of a high degree of microsatellite instability in a tumor that should be treated with an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Another way to determine 
who should get uh, an immune checkpoint inhibitor is just looking at the numbers of mutations. So TMB, total mutational burden. This is something that, again, can be calculated with a panel test across multiple genes. And it doesn't matter which genes they're in. It's just knowing that there are a lot of mutations. And here's some data from non-small cell and small cell lung cancer, again, showing that in, in both cases, they respond better to immune checkpoint inhibitors, in this case, these two inhibitors, um, in tumors with a high degree of mutational load. And then Jonathan, along with two other colleagues of mine, former colleagues of mine, Fei Dong, who is, um, if not now, soon headed to Stanford, and Frank Ku, who unfortunately passed away um, at an early age, that um, a signature can be direct detected specifically um, with next generation sequencing that is a surrogate from um, microsatellite instability mismatch repair deficiency and can again predict which cancers should or should not be treated by the checkpoint inhibitors. And then uh, another of my former colleagues, Lynette Scholl, um, helped lead a project again with John and uh, Frank to extend beyond mismatch repair deficiency signatures to look at other patterns of injury associated with tobacco use, temozolomide, polymerase E, UV light, and apobectiaminase, which is often a viral um, response indicator, and they're working on molecular combination efficiency. All of this can be done with next generation sequencing panels, not with individual genes. And I think in the interest of time, I'll skip HR deficiency, except to say that homologous recombination deficiency <coughs> leads to um, a defect in one mechanism of DNA repair. The other mechanism of DNA repair requires this protein called PARP. And so tumors that have HR deficiency, if they're treated with a PARP inhibitor, they lose both of these mechanisms to repair DNA. That's so-called synthetic lethality is the buzzword for that. And the combination of the underlying deficiency with the therapeutic deficiency leads to cell death. And um, this is a, a established paradigm, particularly in ovarian cancers, um, where BRCA1 mutations are very important in establishing homologous recombination, and then the mutations lead to deficiency states. So I'm going to switch pivot a little and talk about hematopathology, which has some unique um, indications uh, and requirements beyond what's needed in solid tumors. Um, and some unique applications. Um, and so here, in addition to what we've talked about already, which has to do with um, driving therapy and monitoring for disease, we also have some quantitative testing. We have testing to determine if something even is malignant or not, um, which is clonality testing. And so I'm gonna start with that. So um, looking at the clonality of IgH and T cell receptor, gene rearrangements. These are normal rearrangements that take place as opposed to the pathologic rearrangements we talked about in the beginning. Um, that each B cell or each T cell has a unique uh, rearrangement that marks it. And when a large proportion of tumors are derived from the single cell, we call that monoclonal, and that is determined, and that determines cancer in general. And because each B or T cell has this unique rearrangement of IgH or T cell receptor, we can actually assess that by molecular diagnostics and determine if a lymphocytic proliferation is in fact a lymphoma or not. And that's the general application. So I'll just remind you that for the immunoglobulin molecule, the FAB region of the immunoglobulin molecule is where antigen recognition occurs. And that's composed of variable diversity and joining segments that are recombined within each B cell. And then there are constant regions which are the same. But each B cell has a unique combination of VDJ segments that also include um, junctional mutations at the boundaries, as well as somatic hypermutation that occurs as the cells mature. Um, and I think I'll probably skip exactly how this works. Um, but get to the sort of overall diversity for immunoglobulins. We're talking about 10 to the 14th different combinations and a similar process occurs in the T cell receptors about 10 to the 18th, tremendous diversity. 
such that if you test a thousand cells and they all have the same rearrangement, it's statistically improbable that they're not going to be clonally derived. And so we can make it a diagnosis of lymphoma or lymphocytic leukemia simply by showing that all of the IGH rearrangements are the same or that all of the T cell receptor rearrangements are the same. And so this gets at sort of the clinical issue is knowing for an atypical lymphoid proliferation if it's malignant or not. Um, and most of the time, our colleagues uh, are able to make this determination with a microscope and, and some immunophenotyping. But sometimes they can't. Uh, and sometimes the histology is a little bit unusual and the immunophenotype is not entirely clear. And this is where molecular diagnostics come in. And um, we'll talk about that there are some cytogenetic abnormalities that we could find that define some specific um, lymphocytic processes. Um, but then the other thing we can do is look at the clonality of the rearrangements. So we're going to sequence across the rearrangement. And if they're all the same, we're going to say it's monoclonal. And if they're all different, we're going to say it's polyclonal. And so this is what a polyclonal looks like. We look at it at three different positions. I call these dimetrodons after this uh, creature from the Triassic period. And this is what a monoclonal result looks like. And each of those three regions that we sequence gives a single peak. And so we have a case. This is just um, an IGH test that's done on a 61-year-old with atypical LGLs, and it's polyclonal. Why is it polyclonal? Because the LGLs are T-cell lymphomas, and we have looked at the IGH. So it shouldn't have been done in the first place. It was an ordering error, um, but it's this is a very good example of what a polyclonal result would look like. And you would expect, whether this person has a T-cell lymphoma or not, that the IGH would be polyclonal. And then here is a splenic marginal zone lymphoma, and you can see it's a very clear monoclonal peak for IgH, right? And we won't worry about two peaks because two of them can rearrange, and any primer set can have a false negative result. Here's a large mesenteric mass, atypical B cells. They want us to rule out lymphoma. We got nothing here. We got nothing here. These little peaks are the sizing ladder that are used to calibrate the column. And then there's just a little signal down here. Notice the intensity here is about 200. If we go back, these things are in the thousands. So this is a very weak signal. The key here is the fixative. This is B plus. B plus contains zinc. And if you recall, I mentioned that metals inhibit PCR. And so the presence of a zinc fixative prevented this test from working. 48-year-old woman with a atypical B cell infiltrate in the breast. And she's got this sort of polyclonal distribution, but she's got this one peak that's a little bit bigger. And here it is over here. And so is this a clone within a polyclonal background or not? And this is where these get difficult. Um, and to try to understand how much does a peak have to stand out amongst the background for us to call it. And lots of different places use lots of different formulas for it and there isn't consensus. And in the end, this requires medical judgment correlation with clinical findings. Maybe we have to test this person again over time and see if it evolves, if that's possible, or other lesions. Um, and again, this is a physician activity. An instrument can't answer this question. I think in the interest of time, I will skip follicular lymphoma, um, except to say that follicular lymphoma can be negative by PCR because the cells undergo somatic hypermutation, but there's a characteristic translocation in the majority of cases, and we can look for that with a DNA PCR. And so that gets at what I was hinting at before, which is that in some of the hemologic malignancies, there are characteristic chromosomal rearrangements, and we can detect these by FISH or by PCR or by RT-PCR, depending upon what the alteration is. Um, they're typically RNA methods, but not always. Um, and one of the things that we have been able to do is use a new technology, not new, to use real-time RT-PCR to actually quantitate. And so for something like bcr able, this is now standard of care, and I think it's coming in solid tumors, which is to look at the amount of disease and relate that to the disease burden and use that to modify therapy. As with solid tumors and hemologic malignancies, resistance occurs. These are usually due to secondary mutations. Here's a list of them um, and showing how some are responsive to imatinib, which is the first targeted inhibitor for CML, and some are not. And you get complex charts like this, where there are different drugs along one axis and different um, mutations are different peaks, and they have different um, sensitivities. And 
uh, it becomes a challenge when someone fails on traditional CML to understand, on CML treatment, to understand which mutations they have and then know which second line agent they're supposed to get. And so you have to do this by sequencing across um, the region of ABLE where these mutations occur. And there's some clinical criteria that determine when you do that test, which is essentially either they never respond in the first place or they have responded and now they've bumped. There are some ultra sensitive mutation analyses that we need to perform as well. There's some hemologic malignancies where the symptoms are a consequence of the secretory product of the cell. Um, but the cells themselves are in very low amount. And so these include mast cell disease and lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma or Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And so here a molecular diagnosis has to be able to detect a very, very small amount of mutation because the phenomenon that's troubling the patient, whether it's tryptase and histamine or it's um, hyper, um, hyperviscosity due to IgM is not due to a very large burden of the cells with the mutation. And so we developed a next generation sequencing panel for hemologic malignancies called the rapid heme panel. Um, and I'll probably skip this again in the interest of time, but we're able to look at single nucleotide um, variants down to 5%, which is pretty low, but not low enough for those ultra sensitive indications. Copy number changes, and then a new technology that, well, relatively new technology called unique molecular identifiers, molecular barcodes or UMIs, used to clean up the data and make it more readily able to see mutations at low levels. So in conclusion, I said it would be about an hour and it's about an hour. Um, molecular diagnostics is just one part of multidisciplinary work. The core strategies include, as we mentioned, getting rearrangements for very specific entities that are defined by those rearrangements. Multiplex next generation sequencing panel for broad classification and therapeutic indications. There are some smaller ultra sensitive mutation tests for very specialized indications, as well as some quantitative tests, for specialized indications. I didn't talk about it, but a new emerging model is very rapid assays for clinically urgent indications. I talked about the rapid heme panel a little bit, but that's there are tests that can be done same day now. And then um, there are some unique things like clonality testing just to make a diagnosis of an avoid uh, And the test indications include diagnosis, treatment, selection, monitoring therapy, and classifying and prognosis. And, and I said at the very beginning, tumors are mosaic. So whatever method you run, it has to be robust to interference from all the benign cells that are within a tumor. So that's the end of my part. Um, and I will now turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Matt Stackler from UCSF, who will introduce himself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Matt Stackler. I am a um, assistant professor at the University of California, San Francisco. And um, I'm also a molecular pathologist, although I do mostly research uh, compared to uh, molecular pathology, but I do work in the molecular uh, pathology lab as well. So I was just gonna go over a few, um, sorry, just gonna go over a few uh, case examples of, of some of the stuff that we talked about today. And so the first case, is a 60-year-old uh, male who presented with widely metastatic disease. And it was so metastatic that the, the, the clinicians really couldn't um, figure out where the primary was. And so they, they, he had tumors throughout the kind of upper body soft tissues and in the lungs. And, and so they were, they were, they were a, a bit out of a, of a loss of where to start treatment. They did perform a biopsy on one of the, top, the soft tissue tumors. Um, and it came back as a metastatic, poorly differentiated carcinoma. Um, again, there was nothing in that biopsy that suggested where the primary location um, was or where the tumor started from. And really, it was even unknown if this was uh, kind of, of a squamous cell carcinoma origin or of an adenocarcinoma origin. So we performed sequencing um, on that sample. And the first thing you can notice is um, a very high... Uh, tumor mutational burden 
And so most, most cases, this is very general, but most carcinomas have a mutational burden between five and 15 uh, mutations per megabase. And this one, you know, obviously is way above that. Um, we tested for microsatellite instability because that can be uh, one of the ways that you can have a really high uh, mutational rate. And this was microsatellite stable. Um, so we did not see any microsatellite in instability. This is just a very partial list of the mutations, but you can see mutations in uh, ARD1A, NOTCH1, P53, multiple P53 mutations, um, and, and, and the like. Um, and interestingly, if you looked at the overall, the whole range of mutations, we noticed that there was a lot of C to T and G to A mutations and these kind of doublet CC to TT or GG to AA substitutions at um, where they occur at uh, diprimidine sites. And this is the a mutational signature that's typically associated with UV light exposure. Um, and so that would suggest that this tumor originated at um, some uh, location in the body that was exposed to UV light. And given that, and the uh, mutations that we saw in like notch one and P53, um, these findings would really be compatible with a metastatic squamous cell carcinoma uh, from a UV exposed primary. So like a, a, a squamous cell carcinoma uh, from the skin. The second, second case I just wanted to show you quickly is very, very similar to the first. Uh, it was an 80 year old male who uh, presented again with widely metastatic disease, no known primary. They again did a biopsy that came back poorly differentiated carcinoma, uh, couldn't distinguish where the primary was from. Uh, and again, didn't really have a good suggestion of whether it was of squamous or adeno um, origin. So we did the uh, sequencing again. Again, there was an elevated mutation rate. This one's quite a bit lower than the first one, but it was still um, elevated. It was microsatellite stable uh, as the previous one. And again, if you look at the mutations, they're, they're quite similar to, to la the last ones we saw. We see P53, we have multiple notch mutations um, and, and in this tumor. And again, we saw a lot of these C to T and GDA uh, mutations are this UV signature, which would, again, suggest that the primary is most likely a cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinoma. The third case I wanted to show you uh, today was a 70-year-old female who presented with lung adenocarcinoma. She had no reported smoking history. The clinicians wanted to know if there was any, you know, special treatments that they could give her. So we performed the sequencing. Uh, we saw a mutational burden of about eight mutations per megabate. This is much in the, more in the normal range. It was microsatellite stable, as you would expect. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and as kind of Neil mentioned previously, um, certain EGFR mutations can be targeted with drugs. And uh, in this case, we saw exactly that. We, we found an EGFR. L858R mutation um, that makes the, the patient eligible for EGF, EGFR targeted therapy. Uh, so this was exactly what the, the, the clinicians are looking for uh, when we do the sequencing. And so she was able to get on a drug that would uh, be more effective for her. Um, that is kind of as what I said there. However, if you notice, the patient also had another uh, couple other mutations. She had a P53 mutation um, and a DNMT3A mutation. And so if you look at the allele frequencies of the mutations, and this is just the percentage of the, of the, the, the sequencing results or the, the, the number of reads um, that contain that mutation. So the higher this percentage, the higher number of cells contain the mutation. And if you notice, the EGFR and the P uh, P53 mutation are all right around 45%, uh, and so a large percentage of the, of the sample. And however, this other mutation, this DNMT3A mutation, was at a much lower percent. So that suggests that it's a much smaller fraction of cells that had the mutation. And so 
could this be a subclonal mutation in the lung adenocarcinoma, or could it be something else? And it really could be either. You know, it's not uncommon to find subclonal mutations um, in, in tumors. However, um, DNMT3A uh, mutations are very common in a, a, an entity called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. And so as we age, uh, hemato hematopoietic progenitor or stem cells can acquire mutations. And some of these mutations can confer a bit of a survival advantage and allow for a clonal expansion. Um, and these populations then can sometimes be detected in the uh, hematopoietic cells within the solid tumor. So we tested the chunk of, of, of the, the lung tumor, but inside that lung tumor, as Neil explained, there's a mixture of cells. And it's not all just tumor cells. There's going to be you know, blood vessels that containing uh, hematopoietic cells. There's going to be other inflammatory cells. There's going to be fibroblasts and other you know, stromal cells. And so if one of those hematopoietic cells contained an alteration, we might be able to detect that if it was in enough cells. And that's exactly what this is. Um, and so because DNMT3A mutations are very, very rare and lung adenocarcinoma are very common in, uh, in CHIP, uh, I think this is much more likely to be a case of, of CHIP that we identified in this patient. Um, and it's important to recognize this because uh, it can be associated with an increased risk of developing a, sub, uh, a subsequent myeloid or lymphoid neoplasia. So it's, it's something to warn the clinicians of and say, hey, you know, this patient might have something going on. Maybe, you know, this, this would be a, a good patient for a further follow-up. And there's a, just a, a list of mutations here um, that can be common in CHIP. Um, it's not necessarily an exhaustive list, but these are some of the mutations that when, when we see in a solid tumor, you know, uh, uh, we kind of have to think about, uh, about that it might not be coming from the actual solid tumor cells, um, especially if it's at a much lower or different allele fraction than the... Um, the other uh, mutations that we see. And then finally here, uh, we had a, a case of a, a 65 year old female, again, a cancer of unknown primary. There was a bit of a theme here. That's a lot of the cases I end up doing at, at my work are, are cancers where they, they don't really know where the primary is coming from. Uh, but this time she, she basically presented with a, uh, a brain mass that they felt was metastatic. Um, the, during imaging, they also thought uh, she had a, a lung uh, mass, suggesting this could potentially be a lung adenocarcinoma metastatic to the brain. And again, we did uh, sequencing. While um, the mutational profile was nonspecific, it is suggestive of a lung adenocarcinoma with a, a KRAS mutation and an SDK11 mutation, that, that combination is, is, is quite common in lung uh, uh, adenocarcinomas and much less common in, in, in other, mutate, uh, other uh, disease states. Uh, she also had a Smarca A4 mutation, which can be found in kind of, in a low percentage, but a wide variety of tumors. So that wasn't super helpful. It was mainly the combination of the KRAS and STK11, along with the idea that, again, bringing in the clinical information that we had, that she had a lung mass as well. Um, and so that would be, you know, very suggestive uh, of a, a lung uh, cancer. And unfortunately, you know, at the time that we did this diagnosis, we couldn't give any recommendations for targeted therapy because there is, unlike EGFR or BRAF, KRAS uh, at the time did not have any targeted therapies available. Um, and so that, that was uh, not as, as helpful as the clinician was probably hoping for. However, um, things have very, uh, you know, recently changed, um, and now the, the, there is a specific inhibitor for KRAS G12C mutations, and it's important to note that this, this drug is only for KRAS G12C mutations, and so a lot of the other common mutations are not targetable yet, but people are actively working on it. Um, but now you can, you can see a, a, a pretty significant response um, uh, when uh, patients with uh, were lung cancer patients with a KRAS G twelve C mutation are given uh, these as new medications, and again, this was just a, a figure that I pulled from the paper where you can see a decrease in tumor size by a large um, amount or percentage. 
of the patients. And so that was really all of the, the cases that I had. Um, you know, I wanted to just give you guys a quick kind of example of, of, of what some of the things are that, you know, we do in the lab and, and what kind of things that we see and when they may be important. Um, and with that, um, I'm happy to start taking any questions. I know there was a question earlier on uh, MSI uh, uh, testing. And so I tried to answer that in, in, the, uh, in the text. Uh, but if, if you want more details or more clarity, we can ha absolutely discuss that um, right now. Um, um, but, and I see there's one more question. Um, it says, from cases one and two, it seems conclusions are inferred and not straight cut, black and, or white. What data was used to make that inference? And you're absolutely correct. Um, so for those first two cases with the the uh, mutational signatures, they can be, um, it's a bit of uh, an inferred answer. Um, there's, there's certain criteria that we kind of look for, but we don't have any hard and fast rules. It's an area that is uh, an area where we can definitely improve um, our, our kind of our, our, our kind of hardline criteria. Um, but you know we have we know the, the the types of mutations that the UV signature can occur, um, and and so um, we just kind of compare the number of uh, of of mutations that have the mutational signature versus the number of mutations that don't, um, and when that when the number of cases or the number of mutations that have the mutational signature is 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 really high, you know, compared to what you would expect by kind of randomness. Um, then we, you know, say that that mutational signature is present. Um, as far as determining the primary, um, again, there is, you're kind of bringing in all the kind of information. So you're taking the clinical information uh, and you're taking in the, the sequencing results. And, and the fact that we knew that there was a UV signature, the fact that, um, which I probably didn't do a good job of explaining, but NOTCH1 mutations are quite common in squamous cell carcinomas. And so is having multiple p53 mutations. Um, and so taking all of that together, we were able to to in infer that this was likely a squamous cell carcinoma coming from the skin. Um, but it 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 wasn't necessarily an, an answer where he, um, you know there was you know a definitive answer. It was something that was much more. Um, you had to put all the little pieces together. If I could, Matt, I I could. Exp I mean, we had a. Somewhat similar case, um, which we ended up publishing, where there was a, a squamous cell carcinoma of the lung that we sequenced, <clears throat> uh, and surprisingly found an ultraviolet signature in a in a lung cancer. And you know, the sun doesn't shine on the lung, right? And so we were puzzled by this, and it was in the early days of the signature. We we're even wondering if it was working correctly or not, and. Um, the, the oncologist didn't know about any uh, cutaneous cancers. The patient didn't have a cutaneous cancer. And, and eventually, this was someone who had been referred in from another hospital. They, they went back and accessed this patient's records from uh, where they were seen before they came to Boston. And it turned out that this person had had a cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma that was uh, treated about 10 years earlier that was resected and never thought about it again. Uh, and we were able to obtain that sample and tested it and found essentially the same mutations in the lung nodule that had been presented as was seen in the skin cancer from 10 years earlier. And so that finding of the same multiple genetic changes from the original incidental or, or minor uh, skin biopsy to the lung cancer was able to um, establish that this lung mass that we had was actually not a primary lung cancer, but was a metastasis from a cutaneous skin cancer that had been several years earlier. So that's the kind of thing that you can do with um, panel sequencing if you if you can get um, your, your hands on those older samples. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great example. Um... That of where like you know kind of using all of the information together can um, 
can can give you more information than just a singular mutation uh, can. I also I wanted to go back uh, real quickly to a first question uh, that somebody asked about uh, MSI detection. Um, Neil, could you maybe speak a little bit more on on the uh, the mechanisms that we use to look uh, for MSI um, and and how we actually do that de detection? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I don't actually see the question, um, but there's there's multiple different ways to look at microsatellite instability. Um, and uh, they range from immunohistochemistry to um, what's called a microsatellite instability test, um, which is a specific assay that looks at microsatellites uh, to um, looking at pan mutational signatures for mismatch repair deficiency or tumor mutational burden. So first of all, what is microsatellite instability? So, so microsatellites, the definition, they're small repetitive elements of DNA. So usually it's the same nucleotide over and over again, A, 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 or it's a, a dinucleotide, C, A, C, A, C, A, C, A, C, A. Um, and these kinds of repeat elements are more prone to have errors during DNA replication than standard sequence where the, the bases are all sort of mixed together. And it's because the polymerase can slip um, as it's replicating the DNA. And so when that happens, you may get an extra one, or you may get a loss, or you may get multiple gains or losses. You might get an extra two or three. Um, and that creates a mismatch between the sequence that you're making um, and the sequence that you're trying to copy. And so that's, that is a mismatch. Uh, and then there are processes in cells to correct that, which is mismatch repair. Uh, and so when mismatch repair, when that process of repairing this particular type of DNA, it's not really damage, it's an error that occurs, um, fails, those tumors are so-called mismatch repair deficient. A mismatch repair deficiency causes um, mutations to be permitted, if you will, because they can't be fixed. So we say it's permissive of mutations and tumors that have mismatch repair deficiency have many mutations. Um, and the most common type of mutations, not the only type, but the most common type are these variation in sizes of these repeat elements or variations of microsatellites. And so we call that microsatellite instability. They're not really unstable. A better name would be microsatellite variation, but we're not gonna change the name now. So it's, it's called microsatellite instability. The mismatch repair process is mediated by two sets of protein complexes. Um, and uh, they're called MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. And those are the four proteins and they work together in complexes where there's one complex that has MLH1 and PMS2 and a second complex that has MSH2 and MSH6. And each of those proteins has a major protein, each of those complexes a major protein and a minor one. The major one recognizes um, the mismatch and then the minor kind of corrects it. Um, and so when the major ones are deficient, the whole protein is, the whole complex is defective. When the minor one is deficient, it may or may not be defective. Okay, so that's the underlying process. To understand the phenotype, you can look at it at several levels. You could say, are these proteins missing? There's a mutation that has taken out MLH1 or MSH2 or MSH6 or PMS2 or a combination of them. And if those proteins are not there, then you can infer that mismatch repair is not going to work. Um, and therefore, those tumors will have multiple mutations. Um, and that can be done with immunistic chemistry. So you can look to see, are those proteins missing or not? Um, and for MLH1, it works well. And for MSH2, it works well. Those are the major proteins. The minors can be a little soft. Um, and it's because sometimes there's a mutation in those genes that causes the protein to not function properly, but it's still there. And so sometimes the antibodies don't detect what you're looking for. Most of the time they do. And so a standard approach when you're concerned about a cancer that might have mismatch repair deficiency or microsatellite instability, mismatch repair deficiency, is to stain all of them in every case. And that's what we did in Boston. So every colon cancer, every endometrial cancer, those are cancers that are commonly associated 
with mismatch repair deficiency, got this panel of four immunohistochemical chemical stains. And that would be it, right? And if they were negative, uh, if, if the stain showed that one of these proteins was lost, they'd go on and get genetic sequencing to understand you know, what the mechanism was. And if the proteins were intact, they would conclude that there wasn't microsatellite instability unless the patient had some other reason to have an extra high level of suspicion. So maybe they were a young patient or they had lots of cancers in the family or there was some other reason to continue looking. Uh, so if you wanna continue looking, how do you do it? So the simplest way, the one that's been around the longest is the so-called microsatellite instability test. And actually, let me let me um, let me get this slide back up so that I can have something to point to while I'm talking. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen again here. Give me a second. Um, it's the microsatellite instability test where you um, look at. those mic microsatellites themselves and see is the variation in size. I'll just show this view rather than all of them. Hopefully you can see it or. Neil, I'm not seeing your shared screen. Not seeing it. Okay. What oh, about now? Yep. Okay. I'll just leave it on this view for now. Um, hopefully people can see it. Um, so this is what the immunohistochemistry would look like. And if the protein is present, this is an, a negative stain, right? So the pathologic finding is the loss of the protein. So MSH2 and MSH6 are the proteins that are together in one of the complexes. And it's a little hard to see, but these are the tumor cells here and they're all there. And we have a nice internal control, which are the benign crypts, which show everything. But MLH1 and PMS2, they're both missing. So they're both missing. It's probably true the case that MLH1, the major component is lost. And therefore, they're both lost, but we don't know that for sure. But anyway, in this kind of tumor, because these are absent, and there's a little background stroma elements are standing, but those are not tumor cells. We can say that this is going to be a mismatch repair deficient cancer, and then we would try to figure out whether it's hereditary or not, whether it's due to MLH1 or PMS2, and there's other tests that we would do for that. But either way, this is a cancer that should be treated with an immune checkpoint inhibitor like pembrolizumab. Um, and if it turns out to be hereditary, they're not all hereditary, then they need increased surveillance and then we would have to test their family to see if they have hereditary risk for cancer. So the other way to do this is the microsatellite instability test. And here what we're doing is we're, we're, we're amplifying by PCR across those repeat regions that are those elements that are likely to be, um, to slip and to be different in the tumor, uh, in the in the tumor where the copy is made during DNA replication from the original template strands. And so they get bigger or smaller. And so there's a distribution of this as size is along this x-axis, and there's a change in size. We look at a tumor sample, we look at a normal sample. And if the pattern is exactly the same, then we know that there's not a variation between um, the copied sequence in the tumor and in the normal. And so we would say that that's stable. And so this is what that would look like. And so we have five pairs. This is the normal sample, this is the tumor. And this pattern is exactly the same. This pattern is exactly the same. This pattern, this is a little more intense than that, but the peaks themselves are the same. This is the same, this is the same, this is the same. So at all five places where we look, the pattern of bands in the normal is same as the pattern of sizes in the tumor. And there's not a, a slipping during DNA replication that cannot be repaired. So mismatch repair is functioning. Okay. And then we look at a case like this, where here's our normal, here's our tumor. And you see that the normal has these five peaks and the tumor has like nine peaks, they're different. And again, here's our normal, but the tumor has a whole other set of five peaks down here. Normal, here's the normal. And then the tumor again has new peaks. Um, they're usually smaller, but not always, right? Normal, and then the tumor. So here, we've looked across four regions, and in every one of them, the tumor has extra fragments, extra size fragments of these microsatellites, these repeat regions, than the normal does. And so this is microsatellite instability. And the microsatellite instability is caused by mismatch repair deficiency. 
And so the immunostain shows you mismatch repair deficiency. The MSI test shows you microsatellite instability. They're both two ways of looking at the same phenomenon. And then by next generation sequencing, there's another whole way to do it, is you look for these insertions and deletions in homopolymers. So this is just a fancy word for the microsatellites, right? So um, the homopolymer means it's a single nucleotide as opposed to a dye that's over and over again. So A, 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 or T, 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 T. And what we can do is looking across now, instead of looking at five regions, which is what we did with the MSI test, we can look at thousands of regions and we can get a much better resolution view of how much microsatellite instability there is by looking at what are called indels, insertions and deletions. So insertion is you've got too many, deletion is you have too few. It's the same phenomenon. You're losing some, um, losing or gaining some of those repeats. And so you're increasing the variation in sizes of them. Um, but it's just a much higher resolution view of it. So we can figure out from next generation sequencing if there's microsatellite instability and we don't need to do the standalone microsatellite instability test anymore, which requires a normal sample. Here, because we're looking at thousands of samples, we can infer based on how the tumors are relative to their population, which is a statistical assessment, whether or not it's likely due to microsatellite instability and don't need the paired normal sample. I don't know if that answered the question or if I just rambled for far too long, but. No, Neil, hopefully I think, I think that was perfect. Um, so one question was regarding MSI, which is best IHC or PCR? Um, and also uh, they, they wanted to know um, the association of BRAF testing um, and MSI cancers. Sure. Well, so, I mean, this is a, a cop-out answer, but there's no, no method is best because if there were, that would be the only way anyone ever did it. So there, there's strengths and weaknesses to both. Um, immunohistochemistry is technically easier to do. It can be interpreted by a surgical pathologist using their eyeball under a microscope with an immunohistochemical stain. PCR requires extracting DNA, a molecular diagnostics laboratory, and it requires a molecular pathologist to interpret, and it needs a paired normal sample. Um, so. Sometimes you don't have a paired normal sample. If you just have a tiny little biopsy, you're not gonna be able to do it. So then you're gonna to go to immunohistochemistry. Um, so it, it really depends on, on who is the lab and what resources do they have? What expertise do they have? Um, both methods have some false negatives. Both methods have some false positives. The false negatives with the immunohistochemistry are due to functional mutations in the misatropair proteins. As I sort of alluded to, you can have a, a substitution mutation in say PMS2 that prevents it from functioning, but doesn't prevent it from being expressed. And so remember when immunistic chemistry just shows you that the protein is there, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you whether or not it's doing what it's supposed to. Most of the mutations that cause mismatch repair deficiency, take out the protein completely and it's gone. And you can use immunohistic chemistry, but not always. And so they say somewhere between four to 10% um, of samples will have a, well, the immunohistic chemistry will not detect um, the um, deficiency, the defective component. And so that's why what we do and what many people do is we screen with immunohistic chemistry, which works well for 90 to 95% of cases. And then if there's some other clinical reason why we need to keep going, then we'll do the microsatellite instability test. BRAF, did, 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 did that make sense or? Okay, so BRAF, I didn't get into this. So the most common protein that's deficient in immunohistochemistry is MLH1. So most of the time, when one of the stains is negative, it's going to be MLH1 that's, that's negative, about 80% of the time, in fact. Okay. And it turns out that for MLH1, most of the time that it's deficient is not due to hereditary cause. It's due to a sporadic cause. It's acquired during life. So there are for sure, hereditary deficiencies of MLH1. I don't want to say that they aren't, they are. 
But the most likely cause when MLH1 is deficient, which is the most likely cause overall of microsatellite instability, is due to an acquired alteration in MLH1. And the most typical cause for MLH1 to be defective from an acquired, per, acquired perspective is a, a mechanism we didn't talk about at all today, which is epigenetic modification. So it's not actually a mutation in MLH1. It is silencing of the gene. And gene transcription is controlled by promoters. Um, and so if you recall, right, a transcription factor has to bind a promoter and then that leads to a gene being expressed. And if a promoter gets tied up in a ball and the transcription factor can't access it, that turns off a gene without there even being a mutation. That's called epigenetics. And epigenetic silencing of genes, which is what it's called, is not a deletion, it's, it's turned off, it's silenced, uh, is typically due to hypermethylation of the promoter region at specific um, dinucleotides, CGs, which are called a CPG island. And you can look for methylation of promoters as another kind of molecular diagnostic test that we didn't talk about today because it's highly specialized. But that's the most common reason why MLH1 will be turned off, is that the promoter is silenced by methylation of CPGs. Methylation assays are horrible. Um, they're technically very difficult to do. They require acids. They require a chemical called sodium metabisulfite, often called bisulfite, which converts Cs to Us. I, I, I didn't want to get into it because it's kind of a complex thing. And so they're not easy to do. Um, and there's a surrogate. Instead of looking for the methylation of the MLH1 promoter, it turns out that most colon cancers that have MLH1 promoter methylation have a BRAF mutation. Not all of them, it's about 70%. And BRAF mutations are easy. So if you find you have microsatellite instability, and it's due to MLH1 because that's the stain that's missing when you do your immunohistochemistry. Then what you want to do is figure out, is that MLH1 defective because there's a mutation or because it's silenced? So the next thing you would do would be a promoter methylation test, because that's the most common thing to determine that it's silenced. But because the promoter methylation test is very difficult to do, a lot of labs instead do the BRAF mutation test. And if they find the BRAF mutation, it's the same V600E mutation, they, can, they infer that it's an epigenetic silencing of MLH1 because of a statistical association. As far as I know, there's not a mechanistic connection. Um, and then they can uh, proceed to treat well, they would treat anyway, but then they, they know they don't need to follow the family for hereditary cancer syndrome. And then if the MLH, if the BRAF is negative, um, or if the high, or the promoter methylation, if they're able to do it, is negative, then they will sequence MLH1 and look for hereditary mutation that then they can use to test the entire family. Hopefully, you're able to follow that. Thanks, Neil. I think the 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 kind of the, the overall kind of theme or or, or the, the the one take home point is they use you know we use BRAF to help to help us distinguish between cases of sporadic MSI high versus uh, potentially Lynch syndrome or hereditary uh, um, MSI high cases. Um, Perfect. You said in eight seconds what I said in seven minutes. No, 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 you, you, you're right. Yours is a right. much better explanation, but just to kind of summarize and and wrap things up. Um, I think that's the uh, that's the overall thing. Um, any other questions um, or comments that people have for us today? Okay, um, I'm not seeing any other um, questions popping up. I'll give it one more second here. Um, um, maybe I'll just ask Dan if people have questions. Is there someone they can submit them to and then they could be forwarded to us and we can answer them later? Um, yeah, I, I I can definitely make sure. I mean, Dan has our email addresses. I can make sure that he uh, he's aware that we have our um, 
we're open and, and available to, to answer any more questions as they as they may go um as people may start to review things and think about it and they may come up i know usually i always come up with good questions after um yeah. the talk ends so um always happy to, to try to answer questions um later on but uh dan can definitely get a hold of us um if needed okay um yeah great i think well then with that i think we're going to wrap up here a little bit early um i'm going to uh, stop the recording now um